Well more than half of all the COVID-19 deaths recorded in this province took place in long-term care settings. And many more seniors are still living in isolation and fear hardly what anyone wants for them in their final years. André Picard is a health reporter and columnist for The Globe and Mail. He's been watching the difficulties in this sector since well before the pandemic descended, and he details it in his new book. It's called Neglected No More the urgent need to improve the lives of Canada's elders in the wake of a pandemic. And André Picard joins us now from Vancouver, British Columbia. And it's great to have, for my money, the best health columnist in the country on our program again. André, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Glad to have you with us. I'm going to read a paragraph from your book that sets this up in very dramatic form. Elder care in this country, you write, is so disorganized and so poorly regulated, the staffing so inadequate, the infrastructure so outdated, the accountability so non-existent, and ageism so rampant, there seems to be no limit to what care homes can get away with. This is a very blunt and stinging indictment about what's going on. And, and as we learn in the acknowledgments in the back, it is no academic discussion for you. Your parents uh, ran into this situation. What was your family's experience? Let's start there, André. Well, my family's experience was like that of millions of Canadians, uh, sort of this inevitable journey from uh, being well uh, to retirement, to chronic illness, to going to a senior's home, to going to a long-term care facility. And then, you know, the care being kind of overpriced, mediocre, frustrating to man navigate. And then we have something like a pandemic come along and it just really shines a light on all these problems that have existed for a long, long time. And finally, we're paying attention to them. Well, since you mentioned the pandemic, let's, let's go there. And I want to take you back to basically about exactly a year ago. We are starting to hear about this thing and it's making its way around the globe. And I wonder, at that time, what alarm bells should have been going off in the long-term care sector that clearly did not? Well, I think we clearly should have raised the ramparts very early. Uh, I wrote a column before the first death in long-term care saying, listen, uh, long-term care facilities are vulnerable. Look at what's happening elsewhere. Uh, all the people dying early in the pandemic in China, in Italy, in Spain, where there were the first huge outbreaks, they were all elders and a lot of them were in care homes. Uh, all the messaging was there. All we had to do was listen to prevent this, this horror that's taken place uh, subsequently. And why did the bells not go off and why did they not do anything about it? Well, I think a couple of reasons. One is we are very influenced by the history of SARS in Canada. So SARS was quite devastating in 2003. It was very much a hospital-based infection. So this time around, our hospitals were actually very well prepared. We haven't had big problems in our hospitals, but we forgot about these other homes, uh, the nursing homes, the uh, long-term care facilities, seniors' residences. They're not officially part of the health system. We just left them off to the side, even though we knew theoretically they were at risk. They just don't have anyone in charge. They don't have anyone speaking up for them. I want to amplify that last point you just made, because I've heard this from so many people who work in and around health care, that long-term care is, in spite of its title, is not really considered part of the health care system and, in fact, is kind of that, that poor second cousin that you stick at the end of the table that you don't really want to have anything to do with at Thanksgiving. How did that come to be? Well, I think it came to be through our history. Uh, the uh, the long-term care system has its origins, not in healthcare, but in the, the prison system, in the penal system. Uh, we had until 1961 in Ontario, uh, we still had punitive measures in care homes. You could be put in solitary confinement. You had to work for your, your meals, uh, et cetera. So this is, not, this is in my lifetime. So this is not an old thing. Uh, we're really bound by our history. And then we have Medicare, which is in Canada, as you know, very much uh, we pay 100% of physician care and hospital care, and everything else is kind of cast to the side, and some things are cast further aside, one of them being long-term care. It's sort of take our elders when they get old and rickety, and out of sight, out of mind, we put them in these institutions. All right, let's get back on the path and continue to tell the story then of a year ago. When it became apparent that long-term care homes had a problem, how quickly, how expertly, how effectively did the staff in those homes and the people who run those homes respond? 
Well, the response was very slow. Uh, it was laboured. And to be fair, the, the staff just didn't, it wasn't a fair fight. They didn't have uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, staffing is inadequate. Uh, the conditions, the infrastructure is such that it was very difficult to protect elders. When you have three, four people with chronic illnesses sharing a room and a new virus comes along, they're really sitting ducks. So all the elements were there was a perfect storm for the spread of illness. And if we step back, we have to remember that every year in these homes, thousands of people die of the flu, of food poisoning, of all kinds of infectious diseases. These are, these are like cruise ships on land uh, without the fancy buffets. So all the elements are there for, for the spread of illness. And when a new virus comes along, uh, we, just, we have seen just how devastating it can be. I wonder if part of it as well was the fact that, and again, I heard this numerous times as well, you know, these are frail elderly people in their late 80s. What do you expect? That's what we heard. Now, what kind of attitude is that to take to this? Well, we do have that attitude, this ageist attitude that old people are disposable, that, uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times I heard, uh, oh, they were going to die anyhow. And I think we have to we have to combat that myth. It's not true. It's true that everyone's going to die eventually, including us. But the numbers of deaths that occurred, you know, there have been 22,000 COVID-19 deaths in Canada. 16,000 of those have been in care homes. This is a overwhelmingly overwhelmingly attacking this demographic. And you take your average home has about three or four deaths a month in 200. These homes had 50, some homes had 100 deaths in a month. That's There's nothing normal about that. Well, if you needed any more evidence that the arc of this story was deeply disturbing, I mean, they sent the Canadian forces in to some of these homes to help them out. That's how bad things were. How significant did you think that was in the arc of this story? I think it was a very, very important moment symbolically. I think it really struck home to Canadians just how dire the situation was when we saw the soldiers go in. Uh, for me, it's unfortunate that it happened at, in late April and that it didn't happen in March. Uh, they could have... Uh, they could have raised those ramparts that I talked about earlier and, and prevented this had they gone in. And they didn't do, a, you know, they were in very few homes, to be honest, but it was so symbolic. It was so powerful. I think it really, people really understood at that point just how grave things were. Hmm. Let's do some comparing and contrasting here, because when the first wave hit a year ago, apparently 82% of COVID deaths happened in long-term care. 82% of deaths in Canada. That was twice the rate of other OECD nations. Do you know with the second wave whether or not we've got that percentage down? Well, we've got the percentage down a little bit, but only because other people have died. It's been spread. The second wave has actually been much worse. It's been much worse for seniors, and it's been much worse for people in the general community. So we have nothing to be proud about uh, the fact that actually more elders have died in the second wave than the first. So we've seemingly learned no lessons. Uh, one of the most shocking things to me in it, when I read about homes that had an outbreak in last March, had many deaths, and today they're having another outbreak and people are dying again. And it's like, what, why didn't we learn anything in the interim? Hmm. I know it made for a good clip when he said it, and, and it may be the one thing that people remember Premier Doug Ford saying about long-term care. He did promise to put that so-called iron ring around long-term care and truly protect people. That promise was many, many months ago. Are we doing any better today? Well, clearly, no, there's no iron ring because, as I said, the, the deaths were much higher in the, in the second uh, wave. Uh, what's helping people, the deaths have now come down quite dramatically, and it has largely to do with vaccination. Vaccination is having a, a dramatic impact. There were first people vaccinated were in homes, and that gives us some hope. But I just, uh, I, I hope we just don't forget the horrors that have happened because things are suddenly getting better. Hmm. Early on in the pandemic, and you've referenced this already, you did write the piece saying, you know, if you've got relatives in long-term care homes, you may want to get them out if you can, because this looks very desperate. Uh, what gave you, I guess, the notion that this was going to be far more of a crisis than even people who worked within the industry saw coming? Well, I don't know that I had any more insight than anyone else, but I was just watching what was going on again in Italy and Spain. All the all the writing was on the wall. Uh, I think a lot of people, anyone with just even the least bit of knowledge about infectious disease, about seniors, uh, they knew the, the risk. Uh, why it wasn't talked about more openly, I'm not sure, but I, I certainly didn't have knowledge that anyone else didn't have. Uh, I've just 
had the forum to be able to articulate it without worrying about the political blowback. Well, one of the things I like so much about your book is that you really do take us chapter and verse through many of the different elements of this story. You, you point at these specific things and then explain where they fell short and how we can improve them. So let's go through some of those right now. Staffing at long-term care homes. What has been the problem? What needs to happen? Well, there's many things. I think staffing is probably the number one problem. It's where we have to start fixing things. Uh, the problem is there's just enough, not enough time and not enough people to provide dignified care. So what's the solution? Well, we have to start providing, uh, having standards. So guarantee a minimum of four hours of hands-on care for everyone in a long-term care facility. That should be the starting point. Now, they get maybe two hours if they're lucky. So it's just totally inadequate care. Uh, the staffing, the staff is underpaid, overworked. Uh, we know that the conditions of work are the conditions of care. If uh, workers are treated badly, if they're badly paid, there's no way they're going to deliver good care. That's been proven time and time again around the world. So those are the fundamental things. Pay people, uh, treat them properly, and the care will improve dramatically. Well, that leads to the second thing, and it requires, obviously, a, um, a willingness on behalf of the population to pay people more and to spend more, which may require them to be taxed more. Do you see an appetite for any of those things out there? I think the reality is we're paying for this. You know, you pay it from your left pocket privately or you pay it from your right pocket publicly. So the question is about efficiency. How can we deliver the best care for the least amount of money, get the most value for money? And I think what our Medicare system tells us is it's best to do that in a collective fashion to provide care to everyone universally. And we get some uh, benefits of scale, uh, et cetera, and guarantees and not uh, paying. We pay for a lot of bureaucracy when you have private care. So I, I think what we have to do is find a way of, of extending the amount of publicly funded care. The other aspect of it is, uh, yes, it's going to cost more money to fix this because we've neglected it for many decades. So let's not hide the fact that, yes, we have to spend more money. And the third element is we already spend a lot of money on long-term care now, and we spend it for mediocre care. So let's get more value for the money. So the money argument, I think it's, it's important, but it's not unresolvable, and it's not an unbearable amount of money. It's a little bit more money, but spent much more wisely. All right. As we look through the list of problems, we've talked staffing, we've talked funding, we've talked costs to families in all of this. The other thing you point out is that the state of the long-term care facilities in which many of our seniors live has been less than ideal. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, the infrastructure is old. Uh, it's rickety, and I think it's philosophically wrong. What we should have are, uh, if people are going to live in care, and let's not forget, yes, some people do need to live in these facilities, but we have to make sure first that only the people who need to be there are there. I think that would probably eliminate half the need for our homes uh, in the first place. So I say in the book, we should make judicious use of a wrecking ball to get rid of a lot of these old homes. And when we replace them, can't be done overnight, but when we replace them gradually, do so with more home-like facilities. So the countries that deliver elder care well, that's what they do. Uh, the people who are institutionalized, they don't look like institutions. They look like homes, but they have caregivers on site. They have a dozen people, not 200 in a prison-like facility. Let me just follow up on something you said there. You said half the people who are in long-term care today don't need to be there. If that's the case, why are they there? Well, unfortunately, they're there by default because we don't provide adequate home care, because we don't have uh, public housing that's affordable. So if you look at the reasons that people end up in long-term care, often it's pretty banal stuff. It's uh, they can't shovel the walk anymore. They can't walk for groceries. So why aren't we hiring young people to deliver their groceries instead of putting them in a facility at $150,000 a year? So it's about spending more wisely. It's about listening to people's uh, wants and needs. Uh, as you said at the outset, I, I've never met someone who said, oh boy, I'm really eager to go live in a long-term care home. No one wants to. And that fear has grown exponentially during COVID. Uh, I think, you know, the no one, 101% of people do not want to go to long-term care now because of what they've seen. Well, one of the things that the coronavirus crisis has certainly pointed to is the fact that if you can live safely and happily at home with some support, you should. You'll certainly be a lot 
I mean, your chances of getting COVID staying home are certainly a lot smaller than they would have been had you lived in a long-term care facility for the past year. And I think I remember a statistic in your book saying something like, is it over 80% of Danes uh, manage to have their accent on home care as opposed to institutional care? Should we be trying to do more like the Danes? Oh, absolutely. I think Denmark is the gold standard in the world. And what distinguishes Denmark is it's a philosophy. The philosophy is our elders are valued, they matter, and we want them to live in the community as long as possible. So everything is done. They have an excellent uh, home care system. And only the people with the most advanced forms of dementia who wander and would be in danger, only they end up in homes. And those homes are really homes. They're not institutions. So I think it begins with the philosophy of care. It begins with listening to people. You know, to me, it's always been perverse that no one wants to go to these homes, but they're the default setting. That, that just doesn't make any sense to me at all. And we, we have to fix that, and we have to fix it quickly. Yeah, the, th the other thing I don't get is that, is that the most expensive place to take care of a frail elder senior is in the hospital. The second most expensive place would be in long-term care. The cheapest place, the most effective place, would be putting supports in place so they can stay in home. And yet that seems to be the option th that we are the least interested in. Why is that? Well, it's as we t talked about earlier, there's this assumption that things cost more to keep people in the community, and it's not true. We know that from other countries that the costs are comparable. And even if you are like, a, I'll be the devil's advocate, say we believe that it costs more, uh, the easy way around that is to do like Britain. You say, well, you can spend as much as on home care as it will cost us to put you in an institution. So that's $180 a day. If you gave people $180 a day for home care, uh, overnight, we could easily remove 25% of people from care homes and then build from there. So th these are solvable problems for the money we have now. And if we put a little bit more money and effort into this, uh, we can make a big difference in the short term. And let's just understand what home care is. When you're a frail elderly senior, but who is still able to live in your own home with some supports, what do those supports look like? Home care is generally hap helping with the activities of daily living, as the jargon goes. So eating, you know, preparing your meals if you can't do that, uh, toileting, uh, bathing, uh, practical things, shoveling your walk. So just things that you would normally do that you're unable to do because you have some form of, of minor disability. Uh, a lot of cognitive issues, you know, helping you remember to take your pills. These are all things that personal support workers and, and nurses do in the home. And doing it in the comfort of your home just makes it much easier, makes it uh, better. The other aspect of home care, and this is something we don't do at all, that is done in other countries is called reablement. So you don't uh, necessarily cook for someone who can no longer cook because their eyesight is bad. You teach them different methods. Uh, here's how to cook if you're blind. Uh, and that's what the, again, what the Danes do really well. They really put a focus on independence. We're gonna do everything to keep you independent as long as possible. And we don't do that. We do the opposite. We uh, make people uh, couch potatoes. Sit there. We're going to cook for you. You're going to be. You're going to lose your mobility, etc. And it's just the wrong approach uh, for all kinds of reasons. I would like you, if you would, to compare Quebec and Ontario because I note that it was last summer that the government of Quebec decided that it was so important to improve home care they were going to spend what it took in order to get 10,000 more PSWs out and available for the community. In Ontario, we, I guess our government made a similar decision and they made it about a week and a half ago. What, what happened there? Yeah, so Quebec and Ontario are, are slightly different when it comes to the, the base, so where we start. Quebec has a lot more uh, government-provided care, so it's a very publicly funded system. It has way more seniors in, per capita in care than almost anywhere in the world, so a lot of people are institutionalized very early. Uh, Ontario has fewer people in care, but it uh, funds a lot less. So there's a lot more private provision of care. People have to pay out of pocket a lot more. Uh, Quebec, as you noted, uh, during the crisis announced this huge staffing push. So we're gonna hire 10,000 personal support workers. Uh, a year later, 
they have roughly 5,000 new ones. So it's showed how it's difficult to recruit and train and, and uh, keep these workers because it's really backbreaking work. Uh, but Quebec, uh, Ontario, as you know, as you noted, hasn't really put that hiring push on. Uh, they've put more effort into building infrastructure. So they've announced, I think it's $1.8 billion for new beds. And to me, that's troubling. I think the worst thing we can do in this pandemic, uh, and some people find this odd, but I think the worst thing we could do is actually just build more mediocre beds, because that's not what we need. We need to improve the care before we expand it. Let me ask you as well about ownership, because the Ontario NDP, the official opposition, have made who owns the homes that these people live in uh, a, a signature policy issue for them. They have said they want to nationalize all privately owned long-term care homes in the province of Ontario. Haven't quite said how they intend to fund it, uh, but that's their plan. Do you have evidence that says that seniors do better in publicly versus privately held long-term care facilities? I think it's a question that's not as simple as it's made out to be. So I think uh, saying get rid of all private for-profit operators is a, a simplistic solution. I think you have to understand why they're there in the first place. So they're there because government won't uh, invest in infrastructure. So that's a problem you have to solve before the ownership question. I think the question, you know, in Ontario, it's about 60% of homes are privately uh, for-profit homes. Changing that overnight is going to be difficult, if not impossible. I, I think other things have to change first. You have to get the staffing right. You have to remember that whether it's a private a for-profit home, a publicly funded home, they get the exact same amount of money for care. So that's, we have to fix that regardless of ownership. The owners make their money off the accommodation, so renting facilities to you. So to me, uh, where I would put the priority is there are some people in this sector who are slum landlords. Let's put it uh, honestly, mm. we have to get rid of them. It's not all private homes that are bad. It's the ones that treat the uh, the residents as this chattel to be made money off and they don't really care about the care and that's a minority but that's where the focus should be rather than an obsession with uh, for profit okay just as we finish up here i want to do one more excerpt from the book and then i'll get you to comment on it sheldon if you would let's bring this graphic up if there's one thing canada does better than any other country in the world you write it is producing reports and recommendations on how to reform its health system. Since the advent of Medicare, there have been at least 150 inquiries, parliamentary hearings, task forces, and commission reports on the sad state of long-term care, home care, and elder care, not to mention media exposés, academic work, and crise de cœur from families. And yet, very few of the recommendations ever get implemented. The result is neglect by institutional indifference, a combination of bureaucratic inertia constant political changing of the guard and fear of change for which elders have paid a heavy price before and during the pandemic. Uh, Andre, I want to ask you about the current plans of the Ontario government. They have a task force in place right now that has been actually taking testimony from expert witnesses for many months, and they're going to write a report that's due at the end of April. And I guess, based on what I read here, what kind of expectations do you have that that report will go anywhere. Well, I think, unfortunately, most reports essentially become doorstops, right? They're not useful for anything. If you don't commit to implementing recommendations, uh, ahead of time, I just don't think it's useful to do inquiries anymore. So we talked at the outset, it's we need a reckoning, but that re reckoning has to be about action. It just doesn't have to be this looking back, oh, we were horrible, a little self-flagellation, and then we move on. To me, if you're going to... Uh, have an inquiry. If you're going to have a commission, you have to give it a very specific goal. Uh, for example, let's solve staffing. Uh, tell me how to get four hours of care for everyone. Tell me how much it'll cost. And I commit up front to funding that. That's how you do have to do an inquiry. You can't just have this widespread, oh, tell me what went wrong, and then I'll feel bad about it for a bit and forget about it. We've done that for 50 and 60 years, and it's not working. We have to have a commitment to act. Well, the inquiry is supposed to report later this spring, and we will see what they do. And we'll probably have you on then and talk all about it. Andre, I want to thank you for coming onto our program tonight. The name of your book, Neglected No More, The Urgent Need to Improve the Lives of Canada's Elders in the Wake of a Pandemic. It's always great to have you on TVO. Merci, mon ami. Thank you, and stay well. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. 
We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.